Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news, so if you haven't had time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. Stay tuned for our weekly review where we'll give you the scoop on the biggest stories that you may have missed in the last seven days, right from Tel Aviv. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you for joining us. The 20th Knesset officially dispersed on Wednesday as the bill to dissolve it passed all three general plenum votes, officially kicking off the 2019 election campaign. And just, to, just in time to hit the campaign trail, former IDF Chief of Staff Benny Gantz has just announced today the formation of his new political party, Chosen Israel, or Israel's Resistance. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that he does not intend to resign from office, even if indicted by Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit, before or after the election takes place. This according to a report published today in Israeli daily newspaper Israel Hayom. According to the paper, Netanyahu told his inner circle ahead of yesterday's vote to dissolve the Knesset that he believed Mandelblit, quote, wouldn't dare to announce the charges against him before the election, but that even if indicted, Netanyahu said he would remain in office throughout the criminal trial. The report also quoted senior Likud sources as saying that if the attorney general does make a decision to indict Netanyahu ahead of elections, he would become the target of a merciless attack by party officials. But following the report, the Likud party also released a statement denying the allegations, saying, quote, The claim that the prime minister said these things is false, because Prime Minister Netanyahu has not spoken to anyone about this issue, end quote. The Likud statement added that nobody was threatening the attorney general either, and that the pressure on Mandelblit to issue an indictment at any cost was coming on a daily basis from the left and the media. Israeli air defense systems were activated in central Israel on Tuesday night against a missile fired from Syria. The Israeli Defense Forces said that there was no damage and no injuries reported. Meanwhile, Syrian state media reported that Syrian air defenses intercepted hostile targets near Damascus with loud explosions heard near the Syrian capital. And all this as Israeli-Russian relations were finally getting back on track following the downing of a Russian plane in Syria in September. Similarly, this time too, Russian defense officials warned that Syrian air defense systems did not operate properly to avoid accidentally hitting two passenger jets. Syrian TV reported that the aggression originated from above Lebanon, and as such, the Lebanese state-run national news agencies also reported Tuesday night that Israeli warplanes performed mock drills over southern Lebanese skies. While the nature of the targets remains unclear, Newsweek has reported that the Israeli airstrike targeted and reportedly hit several top Hezbollah leaders. According to the report, which Newsweek says was obtained by a Department of Defense source, Israel's airstrike was conducted minutes after the leaders boarded a plane bound for Iran. The source also corroborated previous reports that the Israeli airstrike did in fact target supply points containing GPS-guided ammunition, some of the best available to the Iranian army and Hezbollah. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, a war monitor, reported that the missiles hit three targets near Damascus, which included weapons depots belonging to either Hezbollah or Iranian forces. Three Syrian soldiers were also reportedly wounded in the attack. In related news, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said on Tuesday that Operation Northern Shield to neutralize and destroy Hezbollah cross-border terror tunnels is almost complete. While touring the Israel-Lebanon border with ministers from his security cabinet, Netanyahu said that the operation is, quote, mostly behind us, and added that there has been exceptional work here to deny Hezbollah the tunnel's weapon. It has invested greatly in this, and we have destroyed it. The politicians were briefed by the IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot, Northern Command Major General Yor Strik, and other senior officers. Right, in other news, on Sunday, Israeli Education Minister Naftali Bennett came out against the United States' Middle East peace deal before any of the details of the plan have been made public. Bennett refused to disclose or acknowledge how he knew what was in the plan, but speaking with Army Radio, he claimed that, quote, Trump's deal of the century includes a Palestinian state under certain conditions. We will object to that because that means that there will be another Arab entity west of the Jordan River. Bennett, who leads the right-wing Jewish Home Party within the coalition, has long spoken of a West Bank in which the Palestinians govern themselves, yet still live under Israeli control. But essentially every United States official who has spoken of the White House's mysterious deal has already said that both sides will both love and hate aspects in the agreement. Yet as outgoing United States Ambassador to the UN Nikki Haley explained, both sides would do well to take the plan seriously anyway, as a focus only on what is wrong would result in a, quote, return to the failed status quo of the last 50 years with no prospects for change, end quote. She also added that the delayed deal is unlike any previous plan put forth since the conflict began, saying that it's longer and more detailed than any before as well, and includes ideas previously considered unthinkable. While the plan is scheduled to be published within the early months of 2019, and the whole world is waiting on pins and needles. 
Right, it seems that the government functions, negotiations, and investigations in Israel aren't the only things being brought to a halt following the announcement of SNAP early elections this April. Just hours after Prime Minister Netanyahu dissolved the coalition and in response to it, the White House announced that once again its much-anticipated Israel-Palestinian peace plan will be delayed. Trump administration officials explained that they don't want to influence the Israeli vote. Mark Zell, the head of the Republican Party in Israel, said he couldn't imagine that anyone in the White House would think about releasing the plan in this volatile time. And indeed, Washington has also insinuated that releasing the plan at this time would only serve to be used as a campaign platform one way or the other. First delayed from publication in September, the Trump Middle East peace plan will now only likely be released after the dust has settled in April and after a new coalition is sworn in during the weeks that follow. It's been less than a week since United States President Donald Trump announced that American troops would be withdrawn from Syria, and the world is still trying to figure out how to deal with the decision. Though while IDF Chief Gadi Eisenkot said Sunday that the issue is significant, quote, it should not be exaggerated, end quote. Speaking at the IDC in Herzliya, the military head went on to explain that, quote, for decades we have dealt with this front alone. That's also how it's been over the past four years during the American and Russian presence in Syria, and we've been acting in support of Israel's security interests, end quote. He added that in no way will Israel's ability to act against Iran, Hezbollah, and other terror proxies in the region be hindered either, as, quote, deterrence doesn't drop and isn't built in a day. Our enemies understand our intelligence and air superiority. They see that we are acting against them, against Iran and Hezbollah, and against Gaza as well. The way in which our enemies understand our capabilities provides us with the capacity to act and to cause our enemies not to act, end quote. That being said, many other officials in Israel and indeed worldwide remain heavily critical of the United States' withdrawal plans. German government spokesperson Ulrika Demmer said that much remains to be done against the Islamic State, despite President Trump's insistence that ISIS is defeated, and even most American security officials concur against the White House. Further, an unnamed Israeli official told Channel 10 News that, quote, Trump threw us under the wheels of the semi-truck of the Russian army, the one that transfers weapons to Syria and Hezbollah, end quote. And Justice Minister Ayala Chaked similarly said that the withdrawal would be bad for Israel and great for Syria, Iran, and Turkish President Erdogan. Most notably, that Erdogan will now have a lot less opposition in attacking the Kurds in Syria, who have been strong, loyal allies to the West and to Israel against the Islamic State. In fact, just on Friday, Erdogan again pledged to eliminate the remaining Kurdish militias, along with the rest of ISIS. And then on Saturday, speaking to a Turkish youth conference, Erdogan took another jab at Israel, telling the kids there that Prime Minister Netanyahu is a cold-blooded killer who massacres innocent Palestinians and bombs children, and that, quote, the Jews in Israel kick people laying on the ground, including Palestinian women and children. Prime Minister Netanyahu tweeted in response that, quote, Erdogan, the occupier of northern Cyprus, whose army massacres women and children in Kurdish villages inside and outside Turkey, should not preach to Israel. The uh, order to withdraw United States troops from Syria was officially signed Sunday by outgoing Defense Secretary James Mattis after United States President Donald Trump coordinated the withdrawal with his Turkish counterpart, Tayyip Erdogan. Late Sunday night, Trump tweeted that President Erdogan of Turkey has very strongly informed me that he will eradicate whatever is left of ISIS in Syria, and he's a man who can do it. Plus, Turkey is right next door. Our troops are coming home. Additionally, earlier in the day, Trump and Erdogan agreed in a phone conversation to prevent a power vacuum in Syria after the United States troop withdrawal. In a statement, the Turkish president said that the two leaders agreed to, quote, ensure coordination between their country's military, diplomatic, and other officials, end quote. But CNN also reported Monday that in a December 14th phone call, Erdogan was explaining the problems he had with the presence of U.S. forces in Syria when the United States president reportedly abruptly said, okay, it's all yours, we're done. Meanwhile, on Saturday, Turkey had already sent military reinforcements to northern Syria near an area controlled by Kurdish forces. This after Erdogan has in recent days threatened to carry out an offensive against the Kurds and wipe them out. Well, now in the wake of the United States' troop withdrawal, the Kurds, staunch allies of the United States, are left to face this Turkish threat alone. Trump's latest decisions have come as a shock to other United States allies too, however, as well as to senior Democratic and Republican officials. On Sunday, Trump announced that Deputy Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan would replace General Mattis as the new Defense Secretary effective January 1st, essentially forcing Mattis out of the role nearly two months earlier than his official resignation date. Now, Israel was also shocked by the decision to withdraw U.S. troops, though, though Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has attempted to downplay Israel's disappointment. On Sunday, Netanyahu said that Trump's decision to withdraw troops would not change Israel's policy of acting against Iran in Syria, and said it may even increase Israel's response. 
He reiterated, however, that United States and Israel cooperation will continue in full and, quote, finds expression in many areas, operations, intelligence, and many other security spheres, end quote. Finally, in related news, on Sunday night, the IDF said that its soldiers fired at armed suspects crossing the 1974 ceasefire line in the Golan Heights along the Syrian border. No Israeli forces were wounded, and the IDF is working to determine the intentions of the unidentified gunmen and whether they had been on an intelligence gathering operation or something else. In somewhat related news, it seems that according to Russian Ambassador to the UN Vasily Nembenzia, relations between Moscow and Washington are, quote, practically non-existent, end quote, and there is very little prospect for improvement in the near future. This according to the Associated Press, which reported on Nebenzia's statements on a wide range of topics while speaking to a small group of journalists. Among his stated reasons, Nebenzia went on to blame the ongoing investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller into Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. elections as hindering U.S.-Russian relations for the near future. But that's not all. Regarding the United States' withdrawal of troops from Syria, Nebenzia echoed Russian President Vladimir Putin's views that it was a positive move that would help conclude the seven-year conflict raging in the country. But when asked about the Russian presence in Syria, however, he said the only reason it was there was to prevent another Libya and to curb another terrorist caliphate. In fact, the Russian envoy continued that he believes the greatest threat facing the world today is not any one country, including Iran, but rather terrorism in general. He told the Associated Press that what's needed is, quote, a true coalition to fight international terrorism, end quote, and that he did not believe the U.S. was retreating from the world stage despite Trump's America first rhetoric. That being said, the Russian envoy said he believes the two countries must talk about global issues, including strategic stability and global terrorism, and said that he thinks U.S. President Donald Trump, quote, understands pretty well that it's better to cooperate, end quote. Finally, with regards to Iran, Nebenzia said that he worries about the United States' strategy if its sanctions don't bring about changes of the country's behavior. He told the AP that it's, quote, a danger if they go to the limits, end quote, adding that the enigma and question remains, what would be the strategy about Iran if any state wanted to go to war with the Islamic Republic? All right, moving on, a Palestinian man was shot and moderately wounded earlier on Wednesday when he allegedly attempted a car ramming attack in the West Bank. He was treated at the scene by IDF forces and then taken to the Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva. Thankfully, no other injuries were reported, though three Israeli civilians at the scene were treated for shock. An investigation into the incident has been launched, but according to initial IDF statements, an assailant arrived from the area of Nablus and attempted to run over civilians and soldiers near the Khativa Square. IDF troops thwarted the attack by shooting and neutralizing the assailant. Additionally, eight suspects aged 15 to 20 were also arrested by Israeli police and the IDF on Tuesday on suspicion of conducting violent riots in the form of throwing stones, Molotov cocktails, and shooting fireworks at civilians and security forces in East Jerusalem. Further, during the arrest raids in the village of Askar, soldiers also found thousands of shekels in terror funding and illegal weapons. Meanwhile, while not considered a terror attack, a 40-year-old Israeli Arab man was killed and two more were wounded on Tuesday in the West Bank in a drive-by shooting that, at least for now, has been linked to a fight between criminal organizations. The shooting took place in the northern West Bank near Umal Fahim, and then again today, another drive-by shooting was reported near Umal Fahim as the criminal war seemingly continues. Only this time, a 14-year-old boy was caught in the crossfire and was seriously wounded as a passing motorcyclist opened fire on the car the boy and his mother were in. The victim's family says that they had nothing to do with the criminals in the city, though, and police have set up roadblocks and are looking for those responsible. All right. Tens of thousands of passengers in London were grounded for 36 hours beginning on Thursday when Gatwick Airport, about 30 miles south of London, was brought to a standstill by a small remote-controlled aerial drone flying across the airfield. Well, it turns out that the crisis was finally ended when police succeeded in bringing down the drone with the Israeli-made drone dome system. This after failing at the task with a regular anti-drone system beforehand. The Israeli system can identify and target a drone in any direction from up to 5 kilometers or 3 miles away. It then jams the target's operator radio frequencies, takes over control, and downs it. And if that wasn't enough to bring down the UAV, then Israel's drone dome can melt its target with a focused laser. The technology was largely pioneered in response to Hamas and Gaza terrorism, and six such drone dome systems were sold to the UK for around $20 million over the summer. This incident, which grounded well over 100,000 passengers, however, is still a mystery to authorities who say that this type of issue was unprecedented anywhere in the world. They are also still not aware of any apparent motive, terror or otherwise, though the British military and police do suspect that, of course, the drones were aiming at causing maximum disruptions. Officials are still searching for the culprits. 
Archbishop Pierre Battista Pizabala, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, led the Christmas Eve Midnight Mass on Monday in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, believed by Christians to be the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And the Mass attracted hundreds of tourists from around the world and was also attended by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Palestinian Prime Minister Rami Hamdala. In fact, this year Bethlehem is enjoying its busiest Christmas season on record and has fully recovered from a 10-year low in 2015 that followed the wave of knife stabbings and car ramming attacks. The Palestinian Ministry of Tourism said in early December that hotels were almost fully booked for the holiday season as well due to the relatively calm security situation. First of all, I want to greet you and all uh, your delegation that you came. As uh, according to tradition, you are part of the status quo now. You cannot avoid it. Uh, tradition to celebrate with us the, this Christmas night. We are very happy to have you with us for what you represent. Now, Christians comprise about 2% of Israel's population. According to a Central Bureau of Statistics report released ahead of Christmas, there are approximately 175,000 Christians living in Israel, more than three quarters of whom are Arab Christians, and the localities with the largest Christian populations in Israel include Nazareth, Haifa, Jerusalem, and Shepharam. The report also revealed that the Christian population is growing. In 2017, the population grew by 2.2%, compared to 1.4% the previous year though this increase resulted mostly from the immigration of almost 600 Falashmuva Christians from Ethiopia. <laughs> Ahead of New Year's Eve 2019, the Israel Police, in collaboration with the Israel Anti-Drug Authority, has just announced that they would be handing out free drink kits to test for the presence of date rape drugs. They made the announcement in a viral video posted to social media earlier this week, which has already received over 150,000 views. And in the video, a police officer enters a nightclub and approaches the bar when all the revelers freeze. The officer then instructs viewers on how to use the test kit, explaining that all you need to do is take a few drops of your drink and put it on the small test circle of the pocket-sized test kit, and then wait a few seconds to receive the results of whether or not there are any drinks or drugs in your drink. Uh, the officer then adds, quote, the result came out normal, then you can continue to celebrate with peace of mind, end quote. Well, a quick view on the video's comments section shows that Israelis were very surprised and pleased with the announcement, uh, with many commenting praise for the police and their efforts. And if you're looking to pick up a kit, just stop at any local police station. And now for this week's top five with ILTV's incredible Emmanuel Kadosh. Now, as 2018 comes to an end, Twitter has gathered up some data for us to really get to know the Israeli people. And with a few weeks still to go for something really amazing to happen, we've already had a pretty crazy year. So I'm here to give you guys ILTV's top five list of what was trending on Twitter in Israel in 2018. First up, most of you are already aware that Israel won the Eurovision, that Neta Balzilai is breaking barriers, barriers, and most importantly, the song I'm Not Your Toy should still be stuck in everyone's minds. So naturally, Neta Balzilai's tweet saying, quote, thank you Europe, right after her win in Portugal back in May, was retweeted over 9,000 times. Not to mention that 50 plus thousand times the three-worded tweet was liked across the globe. Israel's Eurovision win was actually one of the biggest trending topics for Israel this year. Second up on the list is another biggest trending event in Israel and was tweeted by none other than the United States President Donald Trump. In his tweet, Trump says, quote, big day for Israel, congrats, referring to when the U.S. moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The tweet itself was liked more than 160,000 times and was most liked by Israelis in the past 12 months. Insane. Third on the list is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's most popular tweet so far of this year, which was actually not even in Hebrew or in English, it was in Hindi tweet from last month where Netanyahu was wishing Prime Minister Narendra Modi and all Indians a happy Diwali. This tweet got more than 70,000 like, likes and that's pretty impressive. Fourth up is actually really shocking to me. The most popular account followed by Israelis is actually the Korean pop band BTS. And the most popular hashtag in Israel this year was actually also related to the love of Korean pop music. And that's really interesting to me considering I figured Gal Gadot would be number one. 
Last but never least, none of these tweets I just mentioned even compare to the top tweet from Twitter's most popular Israeli, our very own Wonder Woman, like I said, Gal Gadot, of course. And I'm referring to her post back in June teasing the next chapter of the Wonder Woman sequel with a picture and a caption that said, quote, She's back, Wonder Woman 1984. This tweet got close to 400,000 likes on social media platform. And I know I've said this before, this is just the start. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. All right, that's it for this week's weekly review. Remember to follow us on Facebook for more news at Israel English News and, of course, on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.